think we're good. We got the sound recording. So oscillatory motion and waves. So back to something we studied a little bit before, and that's the stretchiness of materials and how things can be bent. Well, it turns out that materials that do have this stretchy property, when you bend them out of shape, or if you, uh, or if you hit them in some way, they often oscillate, which means they shake back and forth, they wiggle, right? So here's the perfect example of a piece of uh, plastic, or like a ruler or something, you bend it one way and let go of it, and it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. We've all seen this, it's not anything new. However, we may, we may not have thought about it before as being related to things like springs. Remember in Hooke's Law said that you'd have this force that's equal to negative k times the displacement. So all that really means is if you pull a spring one way, it pulls back on you in the other way. If you push on it one way, it pushes back the other way. And, it, and the harder you pull on it and the further you pull it apart, the more you stretch it, the more it pulls back on you. It's pretty simple. And that's the same thing with like a piece of plastic. If I bend it over this way, the, pl the forces in the plastic try to push it back to where it was. So if you let it go, it goes springing back that way. And then if it springs back through its equilibrium point and goes out the other way, it gets forced back towards the middle. So in other words, there's always this restoring force that is always forcing this wiggling material back to the, the place where it's happy, back to the place where it's right in the middle of its oscillating motion or its vibrating motion. And that backwards force or that force that tries to force it back to where it started is what we call the restoring force. And restoring force is necessary for things like waves. Without a restoring force, you can't get it to keep doing the same thing over and over again. Hmm. It's going to be a long lesson, obviously. We talked about this before, force versus displacement and how it's linear, but it's not always linear. If you bend it too much, it doesn't, it's not in here anymore. And then we have an example of using Hooke's Law, which we've seen before, actually. The example is where you have a car with these springs on it. Can you calculate the spring constant, or can you, or can you uh, calculate how much the springs are going to compress when you fill the car with people or whatever else? It's not a very difficult one, because Hooke's Law is very simple. It's f equals negative k times x. And that's the only thing you're going to use in this particular problem. And I can go through it. We also talked about the potential energy stored in the spring. We've been talking about that even recently, the last couple chapters. 1 half kx squared, where x again is the displacement. That ends up being the area under the graph of the force versus displacement guys. graph. So you can calculate how much energy is stored in a spring, and that energy can be turned into kinetic energy if it is used to propel a bow or to launch something, like launch a human being out of a cannon or something. Right? So you can change that stored spring energy, or that potential energy from the spring, into kinetic energy. And that's great. And again, I'm not going to do the calculation because it's pretty simple. However, now I want to get on to oscillations in a spring. So oscillations in a spring are going to be very similar to rotations around a circle. You have a frequency, which is how often this, it's essentially um, how many times, the frequency is how many times the oscillation or the, the wiggle back and forth or the vibration, how many times it happens every second. And that is the exact inverse of the period of that thing. So the period is the time that it takes for it to go through one vibration, starting in one direction at one point in space and getting back to that same direction, same point in space. And then we call the, the, the period, it's measured in seconds, and one over the period is the frequency again, and it's also measured in hertz or per seconds. So here we do an example of converting to hertz. They tell us the period of a... The, um, they tell us the, uh, the period of something and we're supposed to calculate the frequency of something or vice versa, vice versa. So in the first case, they, tell us, they told us that it's uh, 400 nanoseconds is the period. So that's 4 to, 0 0.4 times 10 to the 6 minus 6 seconds. Take one over that number and you'll get the frequency. The frequency happens to be 2.5 million hertz, so 2.5 megahertz. 
If you're doing it the other way around and somebody tells you the frequency, then you can calculate the period by taking the the frequency and getting the period. So pretty straightforward, pretty straightforward stuff. Now let's move to 16.3. That was pretty quick. That's good. Simple harmonic motion. We're going to start off with an example. We have a mass on a spring on a frictionless table. And we're going to stretch out the spring from its equilibrium point so that we have this force moving it back towards its equilibrium point. Then we're going to let it go. And as we let it go, it's going to get forced back towards the center. But it's going to go right through the center. It's going to keep going. It's got inertia. So it's going to compress the spring, and the mass will feel the force towards the center, which will be towards the right-hand side now. And so on and so forth. It'll just go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. This is what we call simple harmonic motion. The reason we call it simple harmonic motion is because simple harmonic has to do with the idea that you can map out this movement using the sine curve or the cosine curve or combinations of both. Then it becomes what we call simple harmonic or simple harmonic. So let's map this out using the cosine or the sine curve. What did I just do? I just did next check. Wanted to go to the next page and took me to the next chapter. Okay, so here we go. So if we go back to our chapter on things involving springs and other things like pendulums, we learned some things about springs. What happened? What is going on? Well, anyway, we learned some things about springs earlier, and that is that you can actually you can actually make some uh, you can actually make some interesting calculations. And from those calculations, what we're going to learn this time, uh, right now, is that the period is equal to two pi times the mass over the k constant. And actually, I don't know if they actually have a derivation of that. There's not, it's not a very difficult derivation. You can do it if you want to. But anyway, we can actually calculate the period of a mass on a, on a spring using uh, things like forces and distances and, and kinematics, if you want. But in the end, this is what you're going to get. The period for this, for this mass on a spring to go through one complete motion and end up back where it was, going in the same direction, same speed it was going, is 2 times pi times the square root of the mass over the spring constant, the spring. And of course, if you take one over that, you can calculate the frequency using these things. Should we do this one? It's pretty simple. I'm not going to do it. Anyway, in this one, they just give you the frequency or the, the period, and you just plug in. The, or sorry, they just give you the stuff to, to plug in, and you calculate the frequency of the period. I'm not going to do it. It's too. Let's go on to something else. Though. Okay, so there is also a derivation for this, which, we will, um, which we've actually seen part of, which relates um, motion, circular motion, and linear motion. We saw it for circular motion being related, being related to motion along the edge of the circle. Here we're going to have this oscillatory motion, this wave motion, as something that is oscillating and moves by. And since it's changing all the time, because here's the oscillating mass, it's going up and down and up and down, and it's drawing on this paper to see what's happening in time, as time goes by, and because it's time dependent, it's going to have to have time as a variable in the equation. So in other words, x is a function of time now. It's, it actually depends on what time it is. Um, and so it turns out that, first of all, we know that there's going to, this wave is going to have some kind of maximum displacement, which we're going to call the amplitude. 
then we're going to label it with a big X. And so if you're charting this out on an XY axis, you would go from zero to big X on the X axis and zero to negative X on the negative X axis. And then you would, in time, you would just keep going as long as the same oscillates. And that's fine. Anyway, so that's what we call the um, that's what we call the amplitude, and then this equation for the for the position of our wave, or the position of our particle, or whatever it is that's doing this waving. We have the moment we have the uh, the amplitude right out here in front, which is the maximum displacement or the maximum distance that this thing can be from its equilibrium point. Then we have the cosine in there. We don't have to use the cosine to describe this wave. We could also use the sine or we could use combinations of cosines and sines. But we're going to use the cosine because we're going to say that the zero point in time happened um, at a place where it was not on the not at the zero point on the y-axis. So well, on the, act, the vertical axis. Anyway. So we're going to use the cosine since that's the case. And inside the cosine, we're going to have to have something involving time. And it's also going to have to involve the, uh, essentially, the frequency of the, of the oscillator. And so it's going to maybe have to have the period in there as well. And you can see that they've got all that in here. 2 times pi times the time, little t, divided by the period, big t. Oh, sorry, this one. But it's also in this one here for the velocity. It's also in this one for the acceleration. And they just give us these three equations, but they are things that we can derive. It requires calculus to derive, to derive them properly. So we won't do it right now. But it's actually not hard to observe either. It's pretty easy to observe this. So if you start off with your spring displaced at position x and you let it go, it goes through this curve that looks like a cosine curve. And then if you measure the velocity as time goes by on the same, on the same object, you get this curve, which looks like a negative sine curve. Which is why they use the negative sine there. And then if you take, uh, if you figure out the acceleration, the acceleration, you see that you get this curve, which is essentially the same one as this one. The same as the first one, the same as the cosine, it's just an idea, it's just a negative sine. Let's see, where is the... But those are, those are uh, equations to remember for sure because when you're asked, um, you may be asked, you may be told that this oscillator or this, uh, this mass on a spring has started at some point away from its equilibrium point and released or let go. And, and what some time later, how far away is it from its equilibrium point? And you can use those equations to calculate how far goes away, the x equation to calculate its distance, the v equation to calculate its velocity, and of course the a equation to calculate its acceleration. Let's go back one more time here. So what these right here show us when these things are at uh, different positions. So this is positive x position, the maximum in the positive direction, negative x, the maximum in the negative direction. These are at zero here. This is all the x equals zero spots. So uh, what about the velocity? When is the velocity equal to zero? Well, right here is where the position equals zero. And the velocity equals zero here and here. You can see that this point where the velocity or the position equals zero is between half t and t, one half of the period and a full period. This one here is actually between, it's actually at one half a period and one period, right? So, oh sorry, yeah, so it's at, it's at one half a period, it's at one period, it's at three halves a period, it's at two periods. But this one is kind of in between those. The zero comes in between these two. And that is, um, Kind of interesting. And then if you go back, to, if you look at the acceleration, it behaves just like this one, in between the half and the full period. 
is where it goes to zero. And it turns out if you study them well enough and uh, make models, you'll find out the first one follows a cosine curve, the second one a sine with a negative, and the third one a cosine with a negative as well. Pendulum. So the pendulums are similar. Instead of stretching something out and releasing it, you just swing it over so that it will fall in gravity. So essentially, gravity is takes the place of the spring for a pendulum. Gravity is the restoring force of the pendulum. And here we have all the things that we need for this to, to evaluate this. We have a tension force up here. We have the gravitational force pulled straight down. And then we have this... Um, this S vector, which I believe is going to be our, uh, I think S is the displacement, yeah. It's the displacement along the edge of the circular path that this thing is going to follow. So if you go uh, through this arc here, that arc is equal to S. And this one they're going to do a little bit more deriving, just of the, the linear to the angular coordinates. Remember that we have L times theta is equal to S, in other words, the the, in this case, it would be the radius times the, or the length of the string times the angle that it swings through. I lost my mouth for some reason. And the original force is just mg times theta. If we go to the version of force that comes from combining the radial world or the rotational world and the linear world. So if we just have mg theta, it's about equal to that. And... Um, if we plug in uh, theta equals s over l, then we get uh, force equal negative mg s over l for that in particular part. And you'll notice that the mass and the gravitational constant in l are all constants. Right? They're all constants. And so we actually end up with something that looks like the spring constant. Force equals negative k times x. So we should be able to say that pendulums behave a lot like springs. The mass on screen because we just figured it out. Really interesting things happen when you plug in the constant, um, the constant for k from here into the equation for the period from the springs. The equation for the period of the springs is two times pi times m over k. We replace k, we replace uh, the k in that equation with this thing, which is m g over l. So you get mg over l down here in the bottom, place of k. And then you sit, and then you go ahead and cancel off the m, then you cancel off. And you're going to get two times pi times square root of l over g, which is really fascinating to physicists. The reason for that is is because of this result. The m's cancel, so it doesn't matter what the mass is at the end of your pendulum. As long as you have the correct length, because that's the only thing that changes in this equation, is the length. <sighs> so for a pendulum, if you want to change how, uh, how what its frequency is or its period, you just change the length of the pendulum. And here they actually use that length to calculate the constant g. So they have a pendulum that has an extremely accurate length of 75 centimeters. They know it's 75 centimeters out to three digits of zero. They know that those are accurate. So it's a very, very precise measurement. And they've measured the um, period. So it's also extremely precise. It's 1.7357 seconds right here. So now we have the period and the length, and we can solve this thing for g. And we do that, and we get g equals 4 pi squared L over t squared. Then you get g equals 4 pi times 10.75. Sorry, not 10.7. 4 pi squared times 0.75. Then we divide that then by the period that we calculated that we've worked out, which is, um, or observed rather, 1.7357 seconds squared. And then we take the square root of things, or the square of things, and multiply them together. And we get an answer 9.8281. Not bad. Not bad. Don't want to do compound pendulums. 
Okay, now, energy considerations with the simple harmonic oscillator. Again, we're going to go back to this idea of the spring constant with the K thing here. We're going to put together some energy conservation equations, and then we're going to do it in angular because we're going to, have, we're going to want to deal with angular because it's easier to deal with frequencies when you work with angular, const, angular stuff. So we end up with this equation here in the end, and then we figure out, we figure out the uh, exchange of energies in here for this for a very simple system. So this this, this one at the top here is not moving anywhere. How much kinetic energy does that? It's not moving at all. So the kinetic energy is zero. However, the string has been stretched. So how much potential energy does that? Does that have potential energy or not? It hasn't because we stretched the string. That energy is wanting to pull the block now in the direction uh, uh, against the direction that we pulled. So after we let it go, it's been going for a little while and it goes through the center. And the force on it is now zero. Why would the force be zero in the center? Because it has completely gotten rid of its stretchiness, but it hasn't gone to the compression stage. So it's right at the equilibrium point. No compression, no stretching. So what is the potential energy here? Zero, no stretching or compressing. And as it gone up or down here. But what is the kinetic energy here? The velocity is at a maximum. Yeah, it's, the kinetic energy is the maximum. And of course, if you compress the spring completely, or you compress the spring as much as you can, you're going to come to a stop. So you're going to have zero kinetic energy. But you're going to have uh, a maximum of potential energy. Again. And then if it bounces back, you're going to have a maximum potential, maximum kinetic, and zero um, potential again, and so on. So on. Do that all day, then it's going to be the same thing. Right? Add nausea. However, if we plug in these uh, potential energies as one half kx squared, we know that they are when they're in when they're in springs, um, and plug them into our energy equation, we're going to get a one half kx squared for the uh, for the compressed end, and one half kx squared for the uh, stretched end. I believe looks correct. And then we can actually solve this equation for the final velocity, and this is what you get. It's not the final velocity, it's actually the maximum velocity. If you want the final velocity, you'll have to use, you'll have to have some time that it's been oscillating, and you'll also have to have the equation for you. But this is the maximum speed of an oscillator. You can see if you pull it out further, if it's actually bigger, then it's going to go faster. If it's going to it's going to go slower. And we've actually seen that in our everyday lives, I think. You stretch a spring a lot and let it go, it really whips out there. You stretch a spring just a little bit, it doesn't really go far. So to determine the maximum speed, you just plug things into this equation. Pretty simple. All you need to know is the spring constant, the spring, the mass, and the amplitude, which is the maximum displacement. And here's a demonstration that this rotational model works. If you have a, a ball on a wheel and you shine some lights from above, you'll see a shadow moving back and forth. And that shadow will move back and forth according to like a sine wave, cosine wave kind of behavior. And you should remember this with this circle, we did something kind of like this when we were dealing with centripetal forces and rotational motion and all this. But in this case, we're just going to consider as a something moves around this outer circle, we're gonna we're gonna project that something onto the center line, which is kind of like projecting it onto the ground up here, and watch that oscillating motion. And what that's going to do is it's going to give us a basis for these equations. The x times the cosine of omega t now, because for a rotating object, it's omega t. Now that omega, we can, uh, we can equate with the 2 pi over t. So now we have omega is 2 pi over t, and omega is angular velocity. Well, we are going to call it angular frequency. How many times something goes around per second. And to, to convert from angular frequency to... Uh, well, we'll get that in a second. But anyway, continuing on with our equations, we can actually calculate the velocity of this thing at any particular position. If you know the maximum position, the position is that. 
And we've got another equation that you can use for calculating velocity. And then we have another equation we can use for calculating the period. And then we can re rearrange that equation and see that it's the same equation for the maximum velocity that we had before. So we have a derived version now. And we also have an equation for the period. If we reverse it, it would give us the equation for frequency if we invert it. So, what happens if you don't have a perfect oscillator? Well, of course, a perfect oscillator will just keep oscillating forever and ever. There'll be no friction, there'll be no drag, and nothing to slow it down. But a real oscillator actually slows down. So you can see here, this one is going to slow down. It's going to have a smaller and smaller amplitude, right? And it doesn't necessarily actually slow down all the time. Uh, it's not, that's not necessarily the rest of the but it, it's what we call damping. The oscillations get smaller and smaller and smaller. The frequency will probably stay the same. And uh, the period will probably stay the same in many instances. Um, sometimes those are, with different kinds of oscillators, those things can be tied in. But in this case, what we're doing, what we're losing is we're losing energy because of friction or drag or something. And there are a couple different kinds of, uh, of damped systems. You have a system that gets... Um, you have critical damping which happens when the oscillator never even gets through a complete motion or even a half a wave before it's damped out so that's a very quick damping um, it'll be a wave that would look like this without any damping but if you put the damping direction it would look like this it would just be damped out before it even starts then you have, um, that's, so that's critical damping. Then you have um, under damping. And that's what this is. Under damping just slowly damps it out over time. It takes a long, long time. Many, many waves for it to, to damp this out. And, you know, theoretically, it never really gets all the way damped out. And then you have an overdamped system, which means that you're going to go through most of the waves and you may go up, you may come down again, but you're going to damp out pretty quickly and it's going to be within a wave. So again, that is usually done with friction. And here we have an example of this. We have this oscillatory motion that's going to be damped by friction. And so we have to deal with a uh, new, like putting a new thing into our equation. Now remember that the energy equation is always kinetic energy equals potential energy with a change in time. So you end up with uh, kinetic energy final minus kinetic energy initial, potential energy final minus potential energy initial for both of changes. This is shorthand. But those things, when they're added together, the changes in kinetic energy and the changes in potential energy are added together, and they're non zero. They have to be equal to the amount of work done by the non conservative forces of friction. And that's what we're doing here. What we're doing here is we're including friction, kinetic friction, into the equation, and then you're solving for the distance that it's going to go. Because this is the force, UK mg, and mg being the normal force, UK being the kinetic coefficient of friction. And the distance to, to calculate the work, you have to have force and distance. So this is force and distance. And then that has to equal the change in kinetic and the change in potential energy that this thing goes through. So you can calculate, for example, the distance. And it works out. That would be the distance for this particular kind of oscillator, which is, I didn't even check to see what it was. Yeah, it's a mass on a spring. So this would be the, the equation right here uh, to calculate that, the distance in that particular situation. There are other situations. They started at different places, different times, different kinds of things. But, uh, so this part is where it starts to get interesting. So I'm going to get out a little more.
toy. It's always good to have a toy. I'll use a slinky. I got ultra large slinkies for my physics class. I'm going to turn on the video camera here so you can see what I'm doing. Okay, so here's my slinky, right? And we're going to do we're going to do three kinds of oscillations. The first one is going to be a really slow oscillation. Okay, so here's my really slow oscillation. It goes up and down. It doesn't do anything really very interesting. Here's my really, really fast oscillation. It goes up and down, but it doesn't really get all that interesting. That's actually probably not fast enough. But here's a, here's a really fast oscillation. If I do a really fast oscillation, let me do it even faster. Right? Now, if I get just the right oscillation, though, we start to see something interesting. So I'm going to start off kind of slowish, and I'm going to build up speed. And if I build up too much speed, you can see that it gets kind of messy. But if I just build to just the right amount of speed, the wave starts to get really big, and I'm not really adding much to it. And we've all seen this before. We do this when we do jump rope. We all swing the rope at just the right speed. If you swing it too fast, it doesn't work very well. If you go too slow, nothing really happens. But if you just go just the right speed, the wave builds and builds and builds, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And every time you go around, that wave gets a little bit bigger as you add to it at just the right time. That's what we call a resonance. Resonance is the building of a wave upon itself when you add energy to it at just the right time. Resonance is responsible for a lot of things in physics. So we pay a lot of attention to it as we, as we learn it and as we use it. Resonance happens in a particular system with a particular oscillator at a particular frequency, which we call the natural frequency of the oscillator. So here's the natural frequency right in the middle, F sub zero, of a particular oscillator. If you don't have any damping or friction or anything in the system, your, your natural frequency is going to be peaked at here. In other words, you're going to have to be just right on to get it to, amp, to, get it to really get bigger. But you'll notice if you're right on that frequency, it gets really big. It gets really tall in the amplitude. However, if you have damping, it widens out. If you have lots of damping involved, there's actually a wider bandwidth of frequencies that will work. You won't have to be exactly right on it. But it won't, ex it won't uh, make the amplitude jump up quite as high either. So did we do the, did we do the bridge already? <laughs> The video about the bridge collapsing. Couldn't remember. So let's um, let's watch a video about about the bridge collapsing. Okay, so the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. This was built back in the early part of the 20th century, uh, 1930s, I want to say. And what happened is that shortly after, even while they were building, shortly after they started building it, they noticed that the wind was causing the bridge to sway a little bit. And before long, the resonance was obvious. It was building and building and building until it was uh, completely unusual. This was not very long after it was built, actually. This was in the 40s. And so even just a few months after it was built, it couldn't be used anymore. Um, there was a professor that drove out onto the bridge to, to try to do some experiments and measurements. And his car, he actually had to leave his car out there. But eventually it got so big that the road started to crack on the bridge. You can kind of see his car out there. You can really see the cables moving. See his car out there on the left. 
But it's, I mean, it was extreme. Really, really huge amount of uh, crazy things going on. So it's called the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Here you can see the cables moving back and forth on the bridge. So here you can see the professor's car on the bridge a little closer. But notice that it is actually an oscillation. There is a midpoint that doesn't move very much right in the middle where the yellow line that doesn't move up and down very much. This is what we call a torsional wave. It's a twisting wave. It twists back and forth. And the amplitude on either side, you can actually kind of measure by eye. You can see that it goes up and down maybe as much as 15, 20 feet. So that's huge. And then eventually it just broke the cables and the bridge collapsed because there was so much energy being stored up in this wave. So that is the Tacoma Bridge, Tacoma Narrows Bridge collapse. Very famous, of course, in, and here's the professor trying to save his dog who he left in his car. <laughs> Well, that, that was near the end, but anyway, yeah. craziness, totally crazy. Anyway, um, they've since rebuilt that bridge knowing that there's a possibility that this wave could cause this problem, that this, this wind could cause a problem. And we know that if you get, if you get this this force going into it, like the wiggling of the string, if the wiggling is too fast or too slow, it won't cause the resonance, it won't cause the big wave. So what they did is they changed the string, they changed the bridge, <coughs> so that the bridge would not resonate with that wind, so that that wind wouldn't be just right for that bridge, or just wrong for that bridge, as the case may be. And now they have a bridge there that does not have problems. So, now we've gone from oscillations to waves, let's talk about what is a wave. A wave is an oscillation that moves from one point to another through some distance because of the energy that it carries. So a water wave being the most obvious kind, you have water, of course, in the ocean or a lake or whatever else, and when a wave is created on the water, what happens is that part of the water is lifted up somehow. Something causes it to lift up. As that water lifts up, the water around it is actually the water that is making it lift up. It has to get to fill that space with water. And so that water has to come from the area around it, which means the areas around it are down or lower. Well, this energy is potential energy. This water wants to come down again. And when it comes down again, it pushes the water next to it up again. And so on. And that propagates outward. So it causes that, that effect moves outward as the water moves up and down. And that moving outward has a speed to it. We call it the wave speed or the wave velocity. And it's not actually the movement of the water in the direction of the wave necessarily. So in, in this kind of a wave, which we call a transverse wave, the wave is moved, the water is moving up and down. However, the energy of the wave actually is moving perpendicular to that. It's moving outward away from the wave. So the water itself is just moving up and down. It's not necessarily moving sideways. There are waves, like water waves, that do move sideways, like water waves on the ocean. And the reason for that is because when the water moves up, it actually goes out to sea a little bit. And then when it moves down again, it comes back into shore because the bottom of the ocean is not flat. If the bottom of the ocean was flat, we'd have very different waves. If, uh, we'd also have no, no beaches, but that's okay. So, um, that's what we call a transverse wave, is one that moves up and down, um, the, where the waviness is up and down, but the wave uh, moves perpendicular to that. That's the same as the wave on the spring that I showed you. It's moving up and down. How, uh, and then we, we can actually uh, very easily calculate the velocity of the wave. If the wave has a wavelength, which we call, which we give the red line line, and has a period, which is the time for that wavelength to occur, then you take the wavelength, divide by the time, and you're going to get a velocity. 
or you can do the frequency times the wavelength to get a velocity. So that's the wave velocity or the wave speed. So let's calculate uh, a gull in the ocean. We're going to have a gull on the wave in the ocean. And we're going to watch this gull move up and down uh, in five seconds. And then we measure the distance between the bumps on the ocean, the wave crests, that's 10 meters. And the 10 meter uh, is our wavelength and the up and down motion time that we took is our period. And we take the wavelength divided by the period and get the velocity of the wave. Pretty simple stuff. However, there's another type of wave, not just the up and down kind of wave, and that's the transverse wave. So here we have a person holding a slinky making a trans, uh, transverse wave. I said transverse, it's actually longitudinal. But they're making a transverse wave by swinging the, the slinky up and down, and the wave moves forward away from them. But in, an, in another type of wave, which we call a longitudinal wave or a compression wave, instead of moving the slinky up and down, they kind of push the slinky forward. And it causes the springs in the slinky to compress right in front of them. Well, that compression causes the next part of the slinky to decompress. And so this compression actually moves along the slinky. <coughs> this is what we call a longitudinal wave because it moves in the same direction or along the direction of the velocity. So the velocity is forward away from the, the person, and so the waviness is also away from the person. What kinds of waves are longitudinal waves? Well, sound waves are longitudinal waves, where a sound wave happens when you make a sound, like a clap. Right? I make a clap, and I compress the air between my hands. That compressed air causes a decompression of air around my hands. Between my hands is the compression, around my hands is the decompression. As that compression decompression propagates outward and causes more compression decompression away from my hands, that creates a sound wave and it moves in the same direction that it waves. So the compressions and the, uh, the velocity of the wave are in the same direction. <clears throat> now, what happens when we have multiple waves? You can actually add waves together. So here's wave one, here's wave two, and they're the same exact wave. And they're lined up right on top of each other so that the, the crests are in line with each other and the troughs, which are the low crests, are right on line with each other. So when they're right on top of each other like this, what's going to happen is you're going to get a double crest and a double trough. And so it's going to have twice as much amplitude. And if it's sound, that means twice as much sound. Right? If it's light, that means the light is twice as bright. If it's some other kind of wave, it, it increases the energy of the wave, essentially, by double if you have waves like this. However, you have this very interesting thing that can happen, where you have the crest of a wave. So these are the same wave again, but they're not lined up with each other very well. They have the same period, the same wavelength and everything, but they're not lined up very well for that same kind of addition we have a crest here adding together with a trough. And if those crests and troughs are equal but opposite, you're going to get zero wave. So can it happen that you have two sound waves that mix together and create no sound? Absolutely. It happens all the time. Can do that. In fact, if you've ever been to a concert or a, a place where somebody is speaking in a big room, you'll notice if you look around that they have speakers all over the place. And the reason they have speakers all over the place in different places in the room is to eliminate places where the sound might overlap and cancel out. Because you don't want to have somebody in the room who can't hear anything. So you put speakers everywhere so that it covers as much space as possible. What happens if you add two waves together that are not one? Here's wave one. It's got a really long wavelength, and in fact, it's not even a constant wave. It looks like it's getting longer as we go off to the right hand. And then we have a really short wave. And what happens if we add them together? Well, over here, these, this, pod, this big positive press here adds to these little ones and it gets kind of bumpy. And the same thing happens over here. This negative press gets bumpy as you add the waves together. And that's what happens when you're trying, when you start mixing waves of different frequencies and different wavelengths.
Okay, the last one is standing waves. So standing waves happen when you have a wave that is confined somehow to a space. So in other words, you have a spring between two walls, or you have a jump rope between two people, or you have a wave that is going between two buildings, or in a room, you have a sound wave between two walls. Standing waves happen when you send a wave down one direction, and it bounces back on itself, and it creates this addition of waves, which we call superposition. And that superposition of waves can create the, the kind of... Uh, the kind of um, What's the, the superposition of waves creates the uh, resonances that we were talking about before. So let's go back to our little video of myself. Okay, so here is a wave, a standing wave between two points, my hands. If I start a wave from one side and let it bounce off my other hand, so I'm only using my right hand to make the wave, my left hand I'm just holding still. So any wave that I send is just going to go bounce off and bounce back. So I, I send it, it bounces back. Well, if I get just the right frequency, I can get the wave to get really big, and that's a standing wave. But I can also get another standing wave. If I go much faster, I can, I can hopefully get a standing wave that has two bumps in it. So watch this. No, I can't do it. I need your help. Come up here. And I'm going to use a slightly different spring. It'll be easier to see, I think. Okay, come up, stand up here. Hold that. Hold it still. Okay, so here's our, here's our first standing wave, which is just up and down, essentially. And if I hold it tight, there you go. So if I just get it going to the right frequency, it makes a nice big wave. Now, if I stop it, and I go about twice that frequency, I can get a standing wave that has two bumps on it. If I'm really good, I can get three. You ready for this? I almost got three. <laughs> but those are all standing waves. They're waving down one way, bouncing back, and as they bounce back, they build up on each other. They, build, they bounce back at just the right frequency. But you have to have the right frequency. If you don't have the right frequency, the waves don't fit into that space and they don't line up with each other. And this is what's going on right here. For the first wave that I sent through, I had just one wave going across and bouncing back and coming back. And so the wavelength of that wave had to be equal to double the length of the distance between our hands. To get the one that had two bumps on it, the wavelength had to be equal to the length between our two hands. So to get the one with three, and I can show you the one with three, the one with three, my wavelength had to be equal to two-thirds the distance between our hands. And so the frequency had to keep going up. The frequency and the wavelengths are related by the velocity of the waves and the length between our hands. And so these different things are what we call harmonics. And this is one of the reasons they call harmonic motion. Because the sines and the cosines are related to these things by harmonics. So, um, let's see. The wave that only has half of a wave in it, or just one crest and one trough here, that just goes back and forth between a crest and a trough, is what we call the fundamental wave between the two hands. And for something that's just holding still and we're waving along the other side, that fundamental frequency, F1 we call it, is equal to the velocity of the wave divided by twice the length of the distance between our hands, what we call the cavity. And its wavelength is equal to two times the length between the distance between our hands. The first overtone, or the first harmonic, this is actually called the second harmonic, or the first, har the first overtone, has a full wave. It has a crest and a trough, or a trough and a crest, however you want to look at it. And these, these places where there's no movement, is called, they're called nodes. 
And um, the frequency of the first overtone is the velocity wave divided by L, or two times frequency one, two times the first, uh, two times the fundamental. And the wavelength of it is equal to L. And the second overtone, the frequency is equal to three times the velocity over two times the, the length between our hands. It equals three times, and the frequency is three times the first frequency or the, the, um, or the fundamental. And the wavelength is two thirds the length, and you can keep going with this. There's actually a pattern to it. Another thing that we learn about with waves as we add them together is that if you add two waves together that are not the same frequency, then they will create a third frequency kind of thing in their volume. And it's really obvious when you have two tones that are very close together. And let me, uh, let me show a demonstration of that. Oh, uh, let's see. Um, that's not what I want. I want to go here. Um, Let's see if this is the right one. Maybe this one will work better. Oh, this never lets me do this. I always try to install the update, it never works. Maybe it'll work this time. Okay, I have to start over again, I think. Uh, 
Let's I just God. goodness gracious, you gotta be kidding me. You have to be kidding me. Um, okay, so let's try this one. I'm not hearing any sound, however. Let's uh, try to fix that. We're getting close, I promise. Not working. Why do I have no sound? There we go. Wait, what happened to it? Okay, here we go. Next scene. Okay, so here it is. Here we have two different ladies. One, wave one, and wave two. These, these balls represent the oscillators that are making the wave. And ball one is obviously moving a little bit faster than ball two. And if we add them together, we get a frequency that gets really small at one point when they're opposite each other and gets bigger when they're going kind of in, when they're in sync with each other more. And then it goes small again as they get out of sync with each other again. And then it'll get big again. And so it's going to be a loud, soft, loud, soft kind of wave. And we call this beating. When two waves add together that are not quite the same frequency, they're not quite the same wavelength, the resultant wave that when they add together gets loud and then soft and then loud and then soft. And it has its own frequency of loud, soft, loud, soft. So here are two frequencies, 440 and 442, which are kind of a mid-range sound that you might hear if you're uh, doing music or something like this. So there's 440. Here's 442. They sound almost exactly the same. But because they're two hertz difference from each other, when we add them together, there should be a loud, soft, loud, soft that happens at a frequency of two hertz or two times every second. So it should be happening in about da, 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 da. It should go loud, soft, loud, soft, loud, soft at about two hertz. So let's see if it works. So that's what happens in that that loud, soft, loud, soft is what we call beating in music. And this is actually how people who play instruments tune their instruments together. They play the same note together, and if they hear that beating, they know they're not the same, they're not the same tone. They're not at the same frequency. And so they adjust their instruments until that, until that beating goes away. And that beating gets faster and faster and faster the closer and closer you get to the same tone. So that is what we call beats or beating and that's what they're trying that's what they're showing down here in this particular demonstration the beat frequency can be calculated by just taking the absolute value of the difference between the two frequencies and pull that. in the end mm -hmm. So how do we calculate the actual wave energy? We usually use intensity with waves. And the intensity is defined as the power that is delivered to a particular area divided by that area. So the power, remember, is the energy per, um, per uh, time. So this is energy per time per area. Right? So power per area is intensity 
And this, uh, to calculate that, of course, you're going to have to know um, some have some information. In this example, they give you, for example, they give you the intensity of the waves of sunlight on the Earth's surface, 700 watts per meter squared. And they want to know what is the amount of energy that falls on the solar collector uh, in four hours. So it's 700 watts per meter squared. That is the intensity, right? 700 watts per meter squared. So intensity is power over area. Uh, power is energy per time. So we have to kind of plug these different things in the equation. The 700 goes where the I is. The energy and the time are going to go in E over T. Right? Energy per time. So that one ends up being uh, then, then we're going to solve for the energy. The energy is the thing we want to solve for. And the area, of course, goes in one of the areas. When you solve all that, you get, in, you get the energy is equal to intensity times area divided by the time. Here we're making the conversion from hours to seconds because we need it in, in seconds. And so you get 5.04 times 10 to the 6, or 5 million joules of energy falling on a solar collector. And then to calculate the intensity of such sunlight, if it, if it was concentrated by a magnifying glass on an area 200 times smaller than its own. So what is the intensity going to be if you, count, if you put it on a small area? Well, intensity equals power over area. And if you want to have an intensity that is 200 times more, then you have a ratio. Intensity final over intensity initial. Intensity final is the I prime. That has to equal 200. And so that's power over area over power over area. Which, in which case the powers are the same, because it's just energy per time, but the areas are different. So it ends up just being the, the original area over the new area. So it's just an inversion of 200, essentially. Um, so you put in the numbers. You can solve for the final intensity being 200 times the original intensity, so it ends up being 200 times 700 watts per meter squared. A pretty big number. 200 by 700 is a lot. 1.4 times 10 to the fifth watts per meter Then combined intensity of two waves. We have two waves that have one watt per meter squared each, right? And we want to know what is the final intensity of both of these waves. Well, <laughs> intensity is not directly related to, uh, to the amplitude of waves. So we have the, identi the identical waves which have identical amplitudes, but uh, the intensity of the waves is not directly related to that because there's an amplitude squared in the intensity. So intensity is directly related to amplitude squared. And that actually comes, you can, you can derive that kind of uh, in a roundabout way from the, the mass on a spring, but here they just tell you that. And uh, so the, if the amplitude doubles, then your intensity doesn't double, it actually doubles squared. So it actually quadruples. So now the intensity of the wave is I over I equals 4, and that prime over I equals 4. So you take the original intensity, multiply it by 4, and you get 4 watts per meter squared. Here's an example of um, interference of waves where you have two, uh, two speakers that are putting out sound waves and the, um, the lines here that are solid lines are representing, they're representing peaks in the wave and the uh, dotted lines are representing troughs in the wave. So wherever peaks line up with peaks, you get what we call constructive interference between the waves on top of each other, you get louder sound. And wherever troughs line up with troughs, the waves are on top of each other and you get louder sound. But in between these areas, 
um, in between these areas, you get areas where the waves line up, or the peaks line up with the troughs. And those are actually destructive interference, where the waves, where the waves cancel out and you get no sound. And so that's why more speakers are better, because you have more speakers, then you have those spots getting overlaid with sound, because the speakers are not canceling out in those spots. You get less of those, fewer of those spots. And in fact, sound engineers are often hired to, uh, sound engineers and acoustical engineers are often hired to place speakers in rooms or to design rooms so that they have almost no dead spots in them. They have no spots where the sound is zero. There are a couple of famous buildings that are, uh, that are designed really well for that and a couple of famous buildings are not designed all that well for that. In Salt Lake City, there's the Mormon Tabernacle Choir we've all heard of and they perform in what is the Mormon Tabernacle. And the Mormon Tabernacle is a really interesting building because it is a, it's a shape that is an ellipse. You can see it from the outside here. It's like a, like a football shape. And on the inside, which you can see here, you have the front of the building where a speaker might stand. And then you have another point in the building back here. And in between those two points, you have actually two points that you get a lot of constructive interference. So you get, if you get two people on either, at either of those points, they can talk to each other at a whisper and hear each other really well. But there are other points in the building that do not do that very well at all. And so in old times, this was built over 100 years ago, um, it was pretty good to have this building because the people right in the center of the audience out here could hear the speaker without any microphones. Um, the people over here could hear a little bit, but there were some people in the audience couldn't hear at all. And so um, in modern times, they've added some speakers in this building to make it a little bit better. However, in the Chicago, um, the Chicago Symphony Hall, I believe it is. Yeah. Is actually designed in a similar way, but it's designed so that you have, I think this is the right one. It's kind of designed with a similar appearance, but it has, um, it's like the opposite direction. And it creates, uh, it creates a, a kind of a situation where you have sound that is created up here on the stage and then mixed on the stage and then sent out. And so most of the people in the audience get a very, a uh, very uh, um, even kind of experience of the sound. And they don't have to have as many speakers in there as many concert halls do. Really bad one, probably the worst one in the world, is, uh, maybe not the worst, but one of the worst, is the Sydney Opera House, which everybody has seen at some point. This is what the Sydney Opera House looks on the outside. It's got this funky shape, and it's actually uh, three buildings that you're seeing here. This really small one, and these two bigger ones. And you can see all three of them in this picture here. There's a small one and two bigger ones here. And they're all concert halls, or opera house kind of things. But if you look at the inside of it, its acoustics turn out to be not so great and they end up having to have a lot of speakers in there. And you can see all the speakers up in here that transmit the sound into different parts of the... You can see them hanging from the roof and everything else because they have to have them because it's just not very well designed for acoustics. And in, in here you can actually see speakers hanging above actually the stage because even the orchestra can't hear themselves very well. It's just a very poor... I mean, it looks really cool on the outside, but it's very bad for transmitting sound on the inside, for transmitting waves on the inside. It turns out one of the best shapes for transmitting sound into lots of different waves without interfering with waves um, is kind of like a rectangular box, like a shoebox shape, um, where you put the orchestra at one end and the audience at the other end. And, um, well, you put it in, in, and you go across the short way of the box. 
gives you the best sound, which limits you to the size of audiences you can have in a building, unfortunately. So anyway, okay, so that is, let's see what time is it? It's four, almost four o'clock. Let's take a little bit of a break. That's our, our first chapter that we had to cover today. Let's take about a 10 minute break and then we'll, we'll do the second one. Let's see, where do I stop my recording? <laughs>